Hey guys, how's it going? I'm very excited about this study. I've been studying this diligently over the past week, looking at different articles and listening to different sermons online. And this teaching is going to be on the doctrine of man, and more specifically the constitution of man. Does man consist of two partitions or three? And so we're going to be talking about dichotomy versus trichotomy. And what interested me in this study is because recently Brian Denlinger has been using the false analogy that... Um, because he believes that man is made of body, soul, and spirit, that also the Godhead is body, soul, and spirit, the Father being the, the, the soul, the Son being the body, and the Holy Spirit being the spirit, which is completely false. Um, so a lot of people recognize that his interpretation of the Godhead is false, but they don't see that his understanding of the partitions in man is false. Um, I know that trichotomy view is held by many people, and probably most people who watch this video hold to the trichotomy view, and I used to myself, and I may have made a little mention of it in videos here and there. But I never really studied it out, and then that's the problem. A lot of people uh, will say that they believe this to be true, that man has a body, soul, and spirit, but it's only because they've heard it but from, from people saying it, or they've uh, had a misunderstanding of a couple of verses here and there and I uh, probably haven't really studied it out that much because I'm pretty convinced that if you uh, listen to what I tell you today, if you pray about it and you search the scriptures for yourself, that you will come to the understanding that the correct Bible teaching is that man consists of two partitions, body and soul. And um, so we're going to get into that. I have a lot to say. This will probably be somewhat of a long video. I'm going to quote different people, and um, I'm going to go over a lot of different scriptures. So, the question is, is man bipartite, meaning two parts, or tripartite, meaning three parts, two partitions in man, or three? Basically, what I'm going to be teaching you is dichotomy, that man is two parts, body and soul. And then we're going to talk about the trichotomy position. And, you know, as I studied it, and I wondered, you know, is trichotomy true? And I looked at it, and I realized that there's really not a whole lot backing up that belief. There's much more in the Bible that speaks of the dichotomy view. So, dichotomy. Uh, let's go ahead, and I guess that hopefully if the whiteboard's going to be a little easy to see. I realize that some things might not stick out as much, but uh, I've got some new lighting here. and I've got to experiment, and there's light coming in from the window because it's, morning time, and so maybe there's too much light right now, but um, we're going to go with this anyway. So, I, was, I don't know how I want to separate this here, but we got dichotomy, which means two parts. I guess I'll circle that. And then we got trichotomy, and I'll try to organize these things. I'm going to read off a study that I put together uh, on the website, and you know, I'll try to link to that. But you know, I'm basically just going over that in this video. So, dichotomy that man is body and soul, two parts, has been the historic and dominant position of the church. On the other hand, uh, the tripartite conception of man originated in Greek philosophy. Uh, Plato being one of the people um, where this idea kind of came from, which conceived of the relation of the body and the spirit of man to each other after the analogy of the mutual relation between the material universe and God. It was thought that just as the latter could enter into communion with each other only by means of a third substance or an intermediate being, so the former could enter into mutual vital relationships only by means of a third intermediate element, namely the soul. So this is from some Birkhoff systematic theology. And so basically, uh, for me reading that, I just wanted to um, have you understand that dichotomy is the historic position of the church, quote-unquote. And I know that's not always the best arguments, but trichotomy is really a new belief, and I think that it was really popularized by the Schofield Reference Bible. It kind of has to do with dispensationalism. And I also want to say that I realize that a lot of people who will hold to the trichotomy position may not get into all the errors that it can get into. They might not agree with uh, things that other trichotomists teach that I'm going to point out in here. But I do think that it can, it does, it can lead to error, and um, you know, it's error itself. 
but the historic position of the church is dichotomy, that man has two parts, and that the origin of the trichotomy view is pagan or origin, it's Greek philosophy, and it leads to Gnosticism. And so I just want to quote from um, Colossians 2, verse 8, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit and after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. And I believe that um, that's where the trichotomy position comes from. It comes from Greek philosophy. And we're going to so show you from Scripture that it supports the dichotomy view. So we're going to talk about the dichotomy view defined and defended. Okay, and so before I go on to that, I guess that I'll put, um, you know, pagan origin. Okay, pagan origin. It's relatively new, and the dichotomy view is the historic position. Okay. Now, dichotomy view defended, defined. Um, <clears throat> dichotomy view is that man consists of two parts, body and soul. Okay, and so basically, um, you know, I can go ahead and do that. Two parts. It's kind of obvious by now that the dichotomy position is two parts. Trichotomy is three parts. But we'll go ahead and write that up here. So, dichotomy of man consists of two parts, body and soul. Soul, spirit, heart, and mind are all synonyms for the whole of the inner man, the immaterial part. The dichotomist affirms that the Bible teaches that man's constituent elements are the material body and the immaterial soul, or spirit, two ontologically distinct entities. And so... I want to point out that ontological means the nature of being or existing. So we're talking about, we're not just saying, you know, is soul figurative or spirit figurative or whatever. We want to get down to what really, what parts really exist in man. You know, so ontological is the nature of being or existence. So two ontologically distinct entities, which are in mysterious vital union and interact in the union of life. In other words, he is neither pure matter alone nor pure spirit alone, but a wonderful duality and unity and unity and duality. Okay. Now, I'm going to go over the Westminster Confession of Faith, which I know that some parts of that's involved in Calvinism, but there's a lot of good stuff in there too about the nature of Christ and so on. So I think that what they have to say about the body and soul is very good. The Westminster Confession of Faith says that the bodies of men after death return to dust and see corruption, but their souls, which neither die nor sleep, having an immortal subsistence, immediately return to God who gave them. The souls of the righteous are received into the highest heavens, and the souls of the wicked are cast into hell. Besides these two places, for souls separated from their bodies, the scripture acknowledgeth none. So we have the body that dies, returns to the earth, and the soul that either goes to the Lord or it goes to hell. And so, um, you know, I'll put it here to body and soul, or spirit, however you want to refer to that. And then over here, we have body soul and spirit okay now I'm going to quote from Charles Hodge who I think is a Calvinist too but he has a very good statement on the dichotomy the scriptures therefore speak of the soul or spirit not only as that which lives or is the principle to life of the body or principle of life to the body, but as that which thanks and feels, which may be saved or lost, which survives the body and is immortal, the soul is the man himself, that in which his identity and personality reside. It is the ego. Higher than the soul there is nothing in man. Therefore it is so often used as a synonym for self. Every soul is every man. My soul is I, his soul is he. 
What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? It is the soul that sins. You see in Leviticus chapter 4, verse 2, it is the soul that loves God. We are commanded to love God with all your soul. Hope is said to be the anchor of the soul, and the word of God is able to save the soul. The end of our faith is said to be, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 9, the salvation of our souls. In John, Revelation chapter 6, verse 9, and chapter 20, verse 4, saw in heaven the souls of them that were slain for the word of God. From all this, it is evident that the word soul does not designate the mere animal part of our nature and is not a substance different from the spirit. Very good. So first of all, I want to give out uh, what I think is kind of the silver bullet to this whole thing. And let's go back to the creation account when God created man in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And so maybe I'll just list some verses here. But we got Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. I don't know how clear that's showing up on the board. But uh, maybe at the end of it I can zoom in or something. Oh, we'll see. That'll work better. Maybe I'll show up the lights and it'll work, look better right now because uh, there's just so much light in here. But we go to this Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, and it says, The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And so we see that God breathed into man but one principle, a living soul. He formed man from the dust of the ground, the body. And then he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So we just see two partitions there, the body and the soul. There's no third partition. There's no extra spirit there. Two things. And so I think that that right there is valid enough to destroy the trichotomy view. But we'll talk more about this. Let's see. There are uh, many verses, and I got a handful here that point towards man consisting of two partitions, besides the one that I just read, compared to the one verse that trichotomists use to teach three. So there's a handful of verses that I'm going to say here that teach two partitions in man, when the trichotomists basically have one verse that mentions that mentions three that they try to use to teach that there are three ontologically distinct entities in man, body, soul, and spirit. And that's in Thessalonians, and I'll go over that later on. So what we have here is we have body and soul. Body and soul, Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. So we got Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. It says, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Soul and body. Where is the spirit? Can God not destroy the spirit? Why isn't it mentioned? Why is it only body and soul? Two partitions. We also have body and spirit. And so we'll see that soul and spirit are synonymous. And so we can see that here, but I'll go into that in further detail in a minute. So we got Romans 8, 10, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 34. So we got Romans, verses 8, 10, 1 Corinthians, what was it, 7, verse 4, 7, verse 34. Okay. So Romans chapter 8 verse 10 says, And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Okay. And so, you know, I don't know about using that one so much. The spirit is capitalized, right? So that could be talking about the Holy Spirit. And, um, but, I don't know, we got the body is dead and the spirit. But let's go on to the next one anyways. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 4, there is a difference also between a wife and a virgin. An unmarried woman careth for the things of the Lord, that she may be both holy, or holy both in body and in spirit. But she that is married careth for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. So there we have body and spirit, clearly, without a doubt. Before we had body and soul, we have body and spirit. And as I'm saying, I'm sure there are a lot more verses to use, but... 
I'm just giving these for now. So flesh and spirit. Flesh and spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 5. It says, To deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So what about the soul? Well, if we go from what we've read before, it seems that there are two different partitions in man. And so in this one, flesh is mentioned instead of body. Spirit is mentioned instead of soul. It's the same idea. There's a material part of man and there's an immaterial part of man. And there are two partitions. No third one is mentioned. And we go to dust and spirit in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7. Okay. And so I'll go ahead and circle all these because they represent a group where there's two partitions in man. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. So. There we have the dust representing the body, the material part of man, and the spirit representing the immaterial. Now let's see some verses in which soul and spirit are synonymous with one another. And there's quite a bit of them, and there's more than what I've listed, and I kind of just want to run through these really fast. But um, let's see here. I don't even know how much I want to put on here because it's going to be running out of space so much. Um, maybe I won't write these on the board, so we'll just, I'm just going to go over these. So, Jesus was troubled in his soul, and he was troubled in his spirit. Matthew chapter 26, verse 38 says, Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death, tarry ye, and watch me here. He says, My soul is exceedingly sorrow, sorrowful. John chapter 13, verse 21, Jesus had thus said, He was troubled in spirit, and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. And in John chapter 11, verse 33, when Jesus therefore saw her weeping, the Jews also weeping which came with her, he groaned in spirit and was troubled. So his soul is sorrowful, he's groaning in spirit, his spirit is troubled. We see that soul and spirit are synonymous with one another, and there are even greater examples. Mary, her soul magnifies the Lord, her spirit rejoices in God. And these verses are back to back in Luke chapter 1, verse 46 and 47. And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. This is synonymous parallelism or synthetic parallelism. In such cases, the second line of a statement is either synonymous with the first saying the same thing in a slightly different terms, or expanding on the first, giving it a more expansive meaning. Okay, not that there are two different partitions represented here. It's just, uh, this is kind of like poetry, it's a way of expressing ourselves. <clears throat> and so, um, that she was rejoicing of the Lord with her soul and in her spirit. The same thing, it's just to magnify the sense. Okay, Hannah... Bitterness of soul, sorrowful spirit, and 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 10, it says, And she was in bitterness of soul, and prayed unto the Lord, and wept sore. But then later on in verse 15, it says, And Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a wonderful, or I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. So she was in bitterness of soul. She was of a sorrowful spirit. Same thing being spoken of here. Job, anguish of spirit, bitterness of soul. Job chapter 7, verse 11. Therefore I will not refrain my mouth. I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. Same in one verse. Job chapter 7, verse 11. We see spirit and soul used, and they are synonymous. Psalm chapter one, or Psalm 143 we see, um, you know, he jumps around a lot with soul and spirit. In verse 3 and verse 4, For the enemy hath persecuted my soul, he hath smitten my life down to the ground, he hath made me dwell in darkness, as those that have been long dead. Therefore is my spirit overwhelmed within me, my heart within me is desolate. So according to the tripart way of distinguishing 
we would have four entities, the soul, the life, the heart, and the spirit, all mentioned in these verses. Um, so if we were going to say that each one of those things represents a ontologically distinct entity, then there would be four of them. Because he mentions his soul, he mentions his life, he mentions his spirit, and he mentions his heart. Okay, And these are all synonymous. And I want to go more into another study about the heart and the mind, and how they are synonymous with soul, um, <clears throat> but I want to save that for a, a separate study. And, of course, throughout the rest of that psalm, he jumps back and forth between soul and spirit. Isaiah, uh, with my soul I desired, with my spirit I will seek thee. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 9. With my soul have I desired thee in the night, yea, with my spirit within me will I seek thee early. For when thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. So is he speaking of two different, or two ontologically distinct entities here? That he's doing one thing with the soul and he's doing another thing with the spirit and they're both separate entities? No. Okay, it's his inner man. It's the immaterial part of him. It's, it's, it's poetic and it's expression and uh, th those are synonymous with one another. God, um, you know, let's just go on to another part. We'll see that death is, or death as the separation of the body and the spirit or the soul. So, um, in Acts chapter 7, verse 59, uh, then they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He's saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And in Genesis chapter 35, verse 18, And it came to pass, as her soul was in departing, for she died, that she called his name Benoni, and his father called him Benjamin. And 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 21, And he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O oh Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come to him again. So we see the Spirit giving up to God, and we see the Spirit going up to God, and we also see the soul going to God. Um, it's the same thing. Okay. The Spirit or the soul is the immaterial part of man which survives death. First Peter chapter three verse nineteen, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. And then in Revelation chapter six verse nine, and when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God, and for the testimony which they held. When he saw the souls in heaven, where were the spirits of them? It's the same thing. The soul is the life of the body. Which I think is interesting in Matthew chapter 16, verse 25 and 26, where whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? So it's talking about losing his life, and then it's talking about losing his soul. So the soul is equated with life. It's synonymous with the man's life. Anyways, let's go ahead and jump over to the trichotomy, okay? Now, trichotomy teaches that man consists of three parts, body, soul, and spirit. The distinction between soul and spirit is usually described as this, and not everybody teaches the same thing, but generally that the soul relates to the man's self-consciousness and the spirit relates to the man's God's consciousness, okay? And the body relates to world, the world consciousness, they say that the spirit became dead at the fall and becomes alive when a man is born again. Now let's look at some proof texts here. Basically, we have... Okay. Proof texts... We have 1 Thessalonians... Chapter 5, verse 23. 
This is one of the main verses that a trichotomist will go to. And it says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, which is the key word, holy, meaning the whole person, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so this is basically one of the only verses really that speaks of the spirit, soul, and body all in one verse. And so they'll say, see, there there are three distinct entities in man, body, soul, and spirit. But I've shown you a handful of passages over here that just say body and soul, or, you know, flesh and spirit, and so on. It, gets, it just gives us two parts compared to this one verse that has three. So we have to weigh Scripture with Scripture, and we have to, you know, if something doesn't make sense in one way, we're going to have to... Uh, you know, we have to say, well, then, if this can't mean that, then what, what does it mean? But anyways, this verse no more teaches a trichotomy of man than Luke 20, 10, 27, teaching that man is comprised of four parts. See, because Luke chapter 10, verse 27 says, And he answered, saying, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. And so, if we were going to go with the same interpretation that people are going to use on 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, we would have to do the same thing with Luke chapter 10, verse 27. We'd have to say that man has a heart, he has a soul, he has strength, and he has a mind. And these are all four distinct entities within man. But no, they're synonymous, and uh, they're used f to make the point larger, okay? as an expression. Uh, had he a distinct thought attached to these words? Probably not. He's not writing a treaty on the soul, but pouring forth from the fullness of his heart a prayer for his converts. Language thus used should not be too closely analyzed. His words may have compared to similar expressions among ourselves, with my heart and soul. Who would distinguish between the two? Okay, the heart and the soul. Um, who would say that they are two ontologically distinct entities? Uh, and I think I read another commentary that I think is interesting and plausible, and it says that the spirit marks the understanding, the soul, the will. Hence, these two terms give the two principal faculties of the soul. So they're kind of, um, by using spirit and soul here both in the same verse, um, <clears throat> they are... Speaking of, uh, I'm trying to think of some words here. You know, they're giving these different facets of the soul, okay? Of the one ontologically distinct entity there. But let's move on to the next one. Where well, we got Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 says. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Tripartites say the soul is distinct from spirit as joints from marrow. Okay. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. And so they say, see, they must be two different distinct entities there. Well, this passage is unquestionably highly figurative and rhetorical. First of all, we must understand we cannot conceive of the word in any literal sense piercing the joints and marrow. The verse no more intends that soul and spirit are two separate and distinct ontological entities than it intends when we go on to say that the word is the judge of thoughts and intents of the heart. That thoughts and intents are ontologically distinct things. Clearly, intents are simply one kind of thought. What the verse is actually saying is that the Word of God is able to penetrate into the deepest recesses of man's spirit and judge his very thoughts, even the secret intentions of his heart. No aspect of our being is impervious to the penetrating scrutiny of the Word of God. The author does not say that the Word divides the soul from the spirit or that it divides between the soul and the spirit. Tripartites say soul is distinct from spirits as marrow or from joints as joints from marrow. But the parallel applies in another way. Joints and marrow are of the same nature, 
and some and the same constituent elements. Ergo, soul and spirit are not different natures, but the figurative use of the terms joints and marrow simply points to the intensity of the action of the living word. And we have here another pair, discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, yea, three. Now, if one claims that the soul and spirit must be distinct entities, we are, to e we are equally entitled to claim that the thoughts and intents of the heart are all separate. If it asserts that soul and spirit are different departments of the immaterial nature, then heart is another department and thoughts and intents a twofold division of that department. So you cannot stop a trichotomy. You must at least have a tetrachotomy, if not a hexachotomy. Okay, so I think that takes care of that verse. Now, we're going to have some other arguments of um, trichotomy and kind of what they believe. So we got 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. First Corinthians chapter two verse fourteen it says, "But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they and for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned." Here, the trichotomist says that two men, there are two separate men, or two men are represented: the natural man, who is very much a living being, and he must have a body and a soul. Yet the difference between the natural man and the spiritual man is that the natural man's spirit is dead, whereas the spiritual man's spirit is alive. They believe our spirits died at the fall, and that's the aspect of man that needs regeneration to commune with God. Without it, we are lost and merely natural men. So instead of dying spiritually to mean dying to the things of the spirit, they understand it as the spirit as a distinct entity in man literally being dead. The spirit is not functional, they say. And so... We can prove this wrong by pointing out that unsaved people are said to have a functioning spirit. First Chronicles chapter five verse twenty six, and the God of Israel stirred up the spirit of Paul king or of Paul king Syria, king of Assyria, and the spirit of I can't pronounce that one, Telgath Filzner, Filmazer, king of Assyria, and he carried them away, even the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh, and brought them unto, you know. Anyways, the point is that he stirred up the, the spirits of these evil kings. So it says that they have a spirit, and that their spirit was stirred up. So obviously their spirit is not dead in the sense that uh, Trichotomus would say, you know, or even that they have a spirit as a distinct entity from the soul, as Trichotomus would say. But um, we see a verse there, speaking of their spirit being stirred up, Man's deadness is never described as inactivity. It is very active in rebellion against God. Spiritual deadness is defined as separation from God and a lack of communion with them. And we can see that where Jesus talks about, you know, the parable of the lost sheep. Um, and so we kind of get into Calvinism here, too, with the whole deadness of the spirit thing. Um, but we see in uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, he says, And you... Hath he quickened who are dead in trespasses, trespasses and sins, where in time past you walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, and the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. And so they're very, they're very active um, in rebellion against God. Okay. Spirits are being active, they're being stirred up by God. Um, in a sense, still not saying that spirit is a distinct entity from the soul. Let's see here. We got living soul, quickening spirit. We got 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 44, verse 45. 1 Corinthians 15. 44 and 45. Now, it says, It is sown a natural body and raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Again, the trichotomist would say that the natural man has a soul and body, but what separates the natural man from the spiritual man is having a spirit made alive. And so if we take the tripartite view in any sense of its phrase, you will fail 
to make it agree with the apostles thought. The body sown is the body of the Christian that is called a physical body. But even on the crudest trichotomous theory, the Christian here possesses a spirit. So it cannot mean that the future body is to be inhabited by a spirit in contrast to the present body inhabited by a soul. So, you know, that's enough said on that one. So let's go on to some more false trichotomous beliefs. And uh, let's just see here. They'll, I'll write this. They'll say, without a spirit, God cannot commune with man. And a lot of these kind of things are taught in the Schoolfield ref Reference Bible and stuff, and I'd like to go over that more in the future in different commentaries, pointing out the things that trichotomists say, so I'm not just making up stuff here. And as I said, many of you may hold to the trichotomist view, and you may not even know that a lot of this is what's being put forth as a part of that view. So, <clears throat> without a spirit, God cannot commune with man. God is, God is a spirit. Our God is spirit and cannot commune with the physical world. If it were not for the spirit and soul of humans, the teaching allows us to have a God that can deal with us fleshly beings. This is why when we die, both our souls and spirits depart to be with the Lord, to get a spiritual body, but our fleshly body remains behind. Now that's what trichotomists would say. So, to prove this wrong, the soul is active in worshiping God. Okay? Well, they say that the spirit is what communes with God. There are verses that show that the soul is what communes with God. And in Luke chapter 10, verse 27, and I already read this verse, but it debunks, again, this teaching. Um, oops. <laughs> anyway. And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And so before I said, if in First Thessalonians we're going to say, you know, uh, God sanctify you holy, and, you know, spirit, soul, body. If those are three distinct entities, then in this verse we have four distinct entities, because it says heart, soul, strength, and mind. Um, <clears throat> but also... This verse doesn't mention spirit at all. So, if we're to love the Lord thy God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength, with all our mind, if the spirit is what really matters in communion with God, why isn't the spirit mentioned in this verse at all? That verse proves that their false teaching on the spirit is not true. <laughs> and also, um, we got a lot of verses that I can mention, but there's a lot of them in Psalms. Psalm 25.1 Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. Psalm 63, 1. When he was in the wilderness of Judah, O God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee, my soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water was. My soul thirsteth for thee. And in Psalm 130, verse 5, I wait for the Lord, my soul doth wait and in his word do I hope. So we see the soul, uh, you know, in communion with God, longing to be with God, thirsting for God. We see the soul rejoicing in the Lord. When I talked about Mary, uh, that her soul rejoices, or her soul magnifies the Lord. And um, <clears throat> spirit's not even mentioned in Luke chapter 10, verse 27. So what they say about, you know, man can our God cannot commune with man without him having this third ontological, ontologically distinct entity is false because we very much see the soul in communion with God. They also say that the spirit is what separates man from beast. Okay, so here's their different little arguments here. Spirit is what separates <laughs> I'm being kind of sloppy here with the writing, but man from beast. I'm just getting kind of exhausted with this study. 
Uh, it's been a lot of work into it. I'm just glad to finally be making this video, and I don't know how good it's going to come across. But the important thing is that the information is here, and uh, you know I've got it on the website, and so I've I've learned a lot from this, and you know it's going to go into my other studies. So hopefully you'll learn a lot too. But they say that spirit is what separates man from beast. We must have a component that differentiates us from animals, and that is our spirit. They say. Well, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 21 says, Who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward, and the spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth? So if we're going to take this as meaning that spirit is a third ontologically distinct entity, then apparently animals have that spirit too. Because it says that man's spirit goes upward, and the spirit of the beast goeth downward. So apparently uh, if the men have spirit as a third entity, then so do animals, according to this verse. But I want to say that there is an immeasurable difference between the nature of man and of the animals, between their souls or spirits. Man was made in the image of God. The soul of man exists eternally. Jesus did not die to redeem animals, but man. Men are declared sons of God, not animals. The difference is certainly not expressed as the tripartite theory, which would require it to be expressed by the ascription, ascription of the spirit as well as the soul to man, and only the soul to beasts. So not only would they have to de deny the Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 21, which says that animals have a spirit, if we're going to go with that, they would also have to explain where in scripture does it teach that um, animals only have a body and soul compared to men having a body, soul, and a spirit. That's not mentioned. So that's a false argument from them. Here's another argument that goes against um, <clears throat> the trichotomy view. And uh, it's the testimony of consciousness. And I want to read from Charles Hodge again. He said, It is fair to appeal to the testimony of consciousness on the subject. We are conscious of our bodies and we are conscious of our souls the exercises and states of each. But no man is conscious of the soul as different from the spirit. In other words, consciousness reveals the existence of two substances in, in the constitution of our nature, but it does not reveal the existence of three substances, and therefore the existence of more than two cannot rationally be assumed. And it's also not taught in scripture, which is more important. But we can appeal to the testimony of consciousness. Now, I want to say, why does this matter? Well, all doctor matters, you know. Um, this isn't necessarily something that we have to divide over unless that somebody's taking this to an extreme where it leads to heresy or something, which it can, and I want to point that out. But, um, you know, all scripture matters. Uh, every doctrine we affirm has consequences which will inevitably affect our lives as Christians, and trichotomy is no exception. There are many notable instances among influential evangelicals wherein trichotomy has led a, f a foothold for the Gnostic impulse with all of its associated do doctrinal fallout. So it can lead to modalism because trichotomists will teach that man is triune because God is triune. The tripartite nature of God reflects the tri or the tripartite nature of man reflects the tripartite nature of God. God is a trinity, therefore man is a trinity. That's what tri tripartites say. This is a false analogy that can lead to heresy because God is three persons, not three parts. Believing that God is three parts is modalism, which teaches that God is one person acting in three different modes. And that's what we have here with Brian Denlinger. He's taking this false teaching that man has three parts and he's applying it to God, saying that God is three parts. Okay? They're both wrong. We also have, uh, it can lead to Apollinarianism, say that Jesus had a spirit and that it was the Holy Spirit. For Jesus to remain sinless and yet human, he must have had a human body and a human soul, but his spirit must be pure. This is why as God he came as human with a body, a soul, and the Holy Spirit as his spirit. That's Apollinarianism. That's what some trichotomy teachers could believe and have put forth. Not all, but they can. Um, and, uh, you know, if we understand that man only has two partitions, then that wipes that whole theory out. Um, 
<clears throat> but yeah, they could say uh, when Jesus gave up his um, when Jesus gave up his spirit to the Lord, he didn't give up his soul or whatever, you know. And they and that the spirit was the Holy Spirit. That's heresy. There's lots of other errors that it can lead to that I could go over. Uh, it leads to Gnosticism, a mystical belief, and a higher knowledge to obtain salvation. There's a lot of it involved in Pentecostalism and. Um, Pentecostalism, you know, they're, they, they're mostly trichotomists, and uh, they have a lot of errors that can spawn from that. For example, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 14, which is kind of another proof text. I can put that over here too. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 14. It says... For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. So they can say that, see, they say man has a body, soul, and a spirit. Here we see the spirit part of man praying, but the understanding doesn't, the understanding doesn't get what the spirit is praying. The understanding is like the soul. And so they want to teach that the spirit is the highest part of man. And, um... I'll just read this. Trichotomy allows Pentecostals to argue that because the spirit is the higher element in, of human nature, speaking in tongues is the divinely appointed means of bypassing the lower elements of human nature, such as the rationality of mind and soul. In the Pentecostal scheme, we can commune with God directly without the hindrances of the lower elements of human nature and language. Indeed, in such schemes, we can commune with God directly, apart from any means at all. Trichotomy Trichotomy conveniently provides the means for a host of neo-gnostically inclined Pentecostal practices. And so, you know, I had a discussion with one of the Pentecostal pastors before, saying, you know, what about this Toronto blessing where men and women were walking around on all fours and barking like dogs and stuff? And I said, that didn't have anything to do with the Holy Spirit. And he said, well, we don't know that. You know, it could be, could be a, a movement of the Spirit. <laughs> so... Uh, you know, they give away to a uh, rational thought and, um, you know, they look at the spirit as being higher than our mind, you know, uh, our understanding. And so, uh, you know, they elevate the spirit to this point. And also, you know, with the whole speaking in tongues thing, and they basically say that the assembly of God says, you know, that speaking in ton tongues is evidence of salvation. And, you know, uh, it's like, you mean to tell me that um, somebody can be a very bitter person, unforgiving, you know, they don't care about the Word of God and stuff, but they spoke in tongues, and therefore, you know, we know that they're saved for sure. And, uh, you know, that's kind of disgusting. But that's what they get to, and it can come from this trichotomy belief of, you know, the spirit as being separate from the soul, and then, you know, all this uh, attention given to that, that second false entity there. So, I hope that you've learned something from this. Basically, man is two parts, okay? Body and soul, body and spirit, however you want to refer to it as. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, there's a whole lot more verses that support the dichotomy position. The trichotomy only has, you know, a handful, you know, mostly one, mostly two, you know, three or four is kind of stretching it with these other ones, but you know, of course, they're going to try to grasp it anything they can. But um, you know, I can see the main two verses that maybe will um, persuade people to go with the trichotomous view is you know, First Thessalonians chapter five verse twenty-three and Hebrews chapter four verse twelve, and I already debunked those. So, and go back to the creation account, Genesis chapter two verse seven, when God formed man out of the dust, and then breathed. Uh, you know, his breath of life into man. And so we have two parts there. There's no third part. Uh, and you can see how, you know, these other arguments for trichotomy, they get into error. Uh, <clears throat> but unfortunately, this stuff just got made popular, and it's just really strongly held by a lot of people. So, uh, but, you know, a lot of you who may believe the trichotomy, you haven't really studied it out that much. You haven't really looked into the, the dichotomy position. So I hope this will persuade you and I'm going to shut off these lights and see if maybe it helps the board get a little clearer. But, uh, got that. These are probably better to use at night when the lights... I need to get some kind of a blackout curtain or something, but it's probably hard to see it at all now. It kind of is. 
Maybe I can zoom in. Let's see. It's still kind of not so clear, but. There's that. I put a lot of study into this, and I hope that you guys will think about it. Let me. Should be able to go down a little bit. So there's all that. Just God bless you guys. Hope you consider these things. Check it out for yourself. Let me know what you think in the comments. Uh, and I'll say a quick prayer. Dear God, thank you for this day. Thank you for the study. Thank you for your word and for sending your son to die for us on the cross. And you're so wonderful. Help us to be like you, Lord. Help us to forgive. Help us to love. Help us to pray and to study your word. And um, we just praise you and give you thanks, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So uh, hopefully get some more studies out soon. I want to do one on how uh, mind and heart are synonymous with uh, the soul. And uh, maybe go over some of the things in the Schofield Reference Bible, how he teaches trichotomy and some of the error that he gets into. But, uh, yeah. So thanks for watching. If you watched this whole thing through, sorry if it wasn't presented in the best way, but it's a work in progress. And uh, this, is a, this was a very taxing subject on me. It was very new to me, and I had to do a lot of research and think about a lot of things. But I'm finally glad that I got to the point of making this video. Uh, but, you know, I'm always trying to, to challenge myself. <laughs> so... Thank you guys, and God bless.